those of you, who, this is the first time, what I try to do in every, uh, every time we meet is actually bring a little bit, you know, uh, taste for my own life as a real estate investor and share it with the group so you can, we can all learn from it. One of the things I keep doing um, every once in a while is I sit down and say, okay, you had so many homes uh, you know, in the past, you have lost some of them to foreclosure, not all of them. Uh, what were the biggest mistakes, looking back, that you should have avoided and not do? And I have to tell you, this is like a circle. I go and I say, okay, I question myself completely. I say, is real estate still the best way for me to go about? Maybe I should consider other ways. But I always you know, go through different milestones in my head, and I find myself always back at the same starting point. For me, my personality, my knowledge, my experience, my, my understanding of the real estate world, is the best tool, and I love the so many ways we can go about it. But I still want to share some of the mistakes I did with you so you can you know, learn from my uh, somewhat unfortunate experience. Okay, again, disclaimer, this time much bigger font. Uh, so uh, can you read it for us? <laughs> just kidding. Um, so I'm just gonna repeat it. Please learn, educate yourself. Get to know, but you use either a professional or take your own action should you decide. Don't come back you know, to me and saying you told me so and I did it because you, did, you, you told me so. Um, that's me. That's very typical of me without the, you know, without the glasses. Um, I've been investing since 2002, mostly single family homes, mostly out of state. Uh, those are the states I've been investing in. Uh, for the most part, single family homes, some land, some commercial. Um, for the most part, long-term buy and hold. I, I do I invest in taxes nowadays for the past three years or so. Um, I'm all, and I had the privilege, and this is my, uh, my badge of honor, I should say, to sit down with over 5,000 investors on one-on-one -on -one meetings and just see what their needs are, what, how can I help them you know, to continue or start or overcome the challenges in the real estate investment journey. It doesn't matter if there were, many of them were experienced, many of them were beginners, all sorts of uh, you know, uh, uh, individuals or actually you know, couples. So the first mistake that I think that I did, I used to do, not anymore, I hope, is ignore the hidden cost. What, did I mean, what do I mean by that? So probably everybody in this room knows we have a selling price of the property and then we have some closing costs. But are those just all the numbers, okay? So it's very important to make sure that we actually calculate and know in advance how much are we gonna spend on this transaction. Selling, you know, purchase price, closing cost, points, broker's fee, maybe there are some costs to rehab the place, maybe just a little bit, you know, cosmetics, uh, when the house is mine to make it rentable, of course, if we have to rehab it, that, that's of course obviously there. Um, some factor in maybe some additional fees to get it rented, additional fees to get it uh, uh, while it's vacant. And, don't, and when you sum up all those you know, numbers, which is not very difficult to do, there's not so many of them, but there's maybe you know, two to six lines of, uh, of, uh, of expenses or, or cost, you should be aware that what I call the transaction cost. Okay, so the purchase price all of a sudden is just a fraction, a big fraction of the entire cost of the, of the transaction. So don't miss on those costs. By the way, those costs go with you to the next level. If you, you, know, if you do a rehab, that's very trivial. But how about when you rent? Did you factor into your uh, analysis um, some vacancy? Maybe you lowered the reported estimated rent just by, you know, by five or ten percent to make sure you are um, you are um, taking into consideration maybe the market will change a little bit so those things are the little cost the hidden cost uh, it's, I couldn't I, I shouldn't even say call it hidden cost but they're not as obvious cost as we normally look at them so just make sure you keep them you know you look for those costs you factor some margins you factor uh, you factor some safety into your analysis into your um, into your uh, uh, preparation before actually moving into the transaction. The second thing, buying land. That's a very, very tricky subject, you know, uh, topic in my mind. So I bought a lot of land in different parts of the country, and most of my purchases were 
some nice communities develop or go, you know, going to be developed. And when you go out there, they're not necessarily too close to you know, the, the center of town or the center of the metro. Uh, so maybe a gated community. But one thing was obvious. It's, there's a lot of lots around. Okay? And I've done that. And probably many of you know of someone or heard of someone that just bought the piece of land, sat on it, on it for the 10, 15, 20 years. It's really appreciated and they sold it for a profit. It's a really nice story, I have to admit. Probably true, but it's not that, you know, not tricky. I think the way you should go about buying land is as follows. In my mind, if you go to an area that there's a, lo a lot of lots available, that's the first sign to stay away from. Now, I'm not saying, don't, you know, never say never, but just maybe that's a good sign to say, you know what, even if they all appreciate, I'm still going to compete with all of them when the price reaches some high point. So, so many lots going up. So, again, I need to compete with those people. So, I need to lower and lower and lower. And so many lots are around. Second, if the community you're buying in is dependent mostly on one company or individual that know the area, that actually own many of the lots in many instances, okay, that's a second sign of something you want to be aware of. The reason is, should you want to say, and everything from experience, personal experience, should you want to sell that lot all of a sudden and you have to work with this person who is an expert and possibly even owning his own lots in the area, guess what happens when a buyer comes through the door and wants to buy lots? So discount, how about, hello, hello Mr. Buyer, let me show you my lots. <laughs> and all of a sudden, um, this, you know, the owner from not in the area is somewhere down the line, if at all on the line, right? So I'm just uh, some guy who's not getting a fair chance of selling the lot, and I've seen that. So my, the, the point I'm, I'm, I'm taking for it is, look at the area you're buying in, in those lots. And this is true for, by, by the way, for many niche projects and, and type of investment. Ask yourself the following question. Should this guy disappear tomorrow? Or should this guy I don't get along with, can I, how easily is it going to be to find someone else to replace him? That's it. So when you buy a house over here and you don't get along with your realtor, guess what? How many phone calls do you need to make until you find another realtor? One, two, maybe three, and you're good. So this is something you want to make sure if you can sell it yourself because maybe you're, it's a distant you know, investment, you want to make sure, okay, if I want to sell this piece of property, whatever that property is, who's going to be there should the expert is not around or the expert has other you know, matters and priorities than mine. So just uh, something uh, to think about when looking, especially on land, but also um, other types of investments. The way I'm looking at land right now is saying, okay, I live in Cupertino, I drive my streets, I see an empty lot, I see many houses, that makes sense to me. I'm not saying it's fair, it's a good price, but that's the logic I'm following. So if I would go elsewhere, I would look for the community that has few lots available, you know, something around that. It doesn't have to be one lot versus, you know, the only left, you know, the only last lot in the community, but at least something, okay, like that. So that means it's already, you know, less competition, you know, maybe uh, um, uh, more available, uh, less available lots to, to sell, and that's something I would, the logic I would follow, yes. Good point. Getting loans on, uh, on, uh, on land is much harder. I completely agree with you. Unless you can put a tent and rent it out. <laughs> and by the way, maybe Toby, will, you know, the speaker tonight, can talk about that because that actually goes with the uh, maybe uh, jumps into the topic he's going to talk about, but I don't know if he's going to cover that uh, aspect of the prefab. All right, moving quickly. Negative cash flow. How many people here heard about the term negative cash flow or buy with negative cash flow? Ooh, that's good. All right, just a few of you. All right, in my mind, from my experience, never buy with a negative cash flow. The reason, I'm, you know, never say never, but never buy with a negative cash flow. Why am I saying this? I like the houses, from experience, to be independent of me. If the house is in a negative cash flow situation, that means I need to put in 50, 100, 500, I don't know how much, every month into it. So that means I'm supplementing for my own income. 
By the way, it makes perfect sense tax-wise. But should you lose your job or your income, income drops, guess what? All of a sudden, those houses, or maybe just a house, is dependent on you. So my suggestion is, put it aside, the house has to be independent of you. i rather, from my experience, one of my mistakes, I wished I bought less, a smaller number of homes with a larger down payment, all you know, with a break even, the worst case, but possibly with a positive cash flow situation. You know what? Even now with the, with the values are down, guess what? I wouldn't care anything if the value is down a little bit or even somewhat, as long as it's rented, paying the rent, guess what? It will probably will come back up. But when the value is down, the cash flow, you know, it doesn't provide you, it's eating you, your income is down, guess what happens? So my suggestion, my suggestion is, the house is independent of you, or houses independent by themselves. Should you want to go on vacation, retire, do whatever, you know, it doesn't affect your life at all. Um, spreading over too many markets, I think you should focus on one or two or three markets. The reason I'm saying it, you know, it also depends on how big your portfolio is. But if you're buying five homes, maybe you should stick to one market. Know the area well. Work with one property management company should you, uh, should you do a, a rental investment. If you work with one property management company, you have a buying power. If, you have a, if they're giving you a hard time, guess what? They may lose this client who has three, four, five homes. Who knows? I'm not, you have to tell yourself at what point I'm not going to put too many eggs in one basket. For me, it could be three. For you, it could be five. You need to decide what this number is. But the idea is not to spread one over there, one over here, and it, and, and it just creates a lot of uh, management time on you. So that's my suggestion for you. And last but not least, lack of guidance. Make sure you have someone that provides you with guidance and support and, and health checks on your portfolio. That's a very critical point. If you don't have this person, make sure you find one. And you make that person your mentor, your coach, whatever you want to call it, and you use this person both to make decisions, to run, you know, right, to bounce ideas off. And when you run, if you're in real estate investing, the chances of you not running into a wall or some, you know, some difficulties are very small, very, very small. So if you're not prepared for it, or this is not, you know, doesn't fit your personality, sorry to be the, the you know, the truth, the truth speaker. But that's the reality of real estate, no matter what type of real estate you do. So you may need someone you can call and say, let me run by you something, or I'm having this problem, or how can I do, and what should I do next, just to keep you, you know, thinking about the process. Make sure you got this person, maybe a friend, an experienced friend, doesn't matter, in your life to help you overcome the challenges that you will have in the real estate investments. Okay.